You are listening to Riverhouse Church's Sermon of the Week. We hope this talk equips and inspires you. So we have been in about a a five-week journey, I believe, on what I've been calling questioning authority. And I I can't recap it all because it would take too long, but essentially been on a journey of, of, of recognizing, one, that disciples are learners and learners ask questions. They don't make assumptions. And what we've been learning about in this season is actually authority, what authority is, how Jesus has deposited it into the church, and ultimately how the church plays this role, this role of tutoring us into the leadership of Jesus, right? And Jesus actually exercises authority through the local church to disciple us according to his leadership. Does that make sense? And so that's a lot of messages that if you've missed, I'd encourage you to listen to because it will even give more of a richness to what's happening tonight. But the last few weeks in particular, we've contextualized all of it into our mission, which is a, a people of prayer, family, and mission. And so we talked about prayer and uh, intimate connection with God in vertical ministry environments, which is like a Sunday, where the goal is actually to camp around the presence and encounter the glory of God. And family, which we try to cultivate in revival groups here, healthy family, is we, we encounter God, then we cultivate that through connection with one another and in relationship and learning how to, to, to be family like God is family. And then mission is really the ultimate goal, and that is as we have have come into intimate connection with God, cultivated that through our family and community, we then give away the beauty of that to the world, right? And so mission really is radical generosity um, and, and expression to culture, to the world. Um, and so we're going to talk tonight about the missional DNA of River House to the city of Boise, Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Come on. They're more excited than you guys. All right. It's like a competition, okay? You all get a, you all get a sticker at the end, whoever's the loudest. Just joking. So uh, I'm going to start just reading a quote. This is uh, by a man named Dr. Roland Baker. He's the co-founder and, and leader of uh, Iris Ministries, Iris Global, which is a global missions movement. And uh, he says this. He's also a theologian and a scholar, and this is, this is what he writes. It should not require great prophetic powers to perceive that in this life, Christianity is missions. As long as others have less than we do, the love of God compels us to share what we have. As long as we possess the presence and power of God that others do not, we have a mission to accomplish. Jesus came not to judge the world, but to save it. And if we want fellowship with him, we must partake of his nature and have his purpose in common. If what we have is of value, we cannot keep it to ourselves. We should not have to argue the primacy of missions before the church. If we know anything of the love of God, we know the good news applies to everyone on the planet, even in the furthest corners. If people everywhere need what we possess, missions is logical, natural, and morally obligatory for those who believe. You can think on that one for a few years, so. <laughs> but I want to talk about mission and this, this giving, this radical generosity of everything what we receive on a Sunday in revival group, in community, and the actual, you know, the, the, the push to give it away. Right? And I, I actually want to talk about the missional DNA of our local church to our city. And so we have a, a, a missions organization called Riverhouse Global that is attached to Riverhouse that does overseas missions that, that I'm not going to talk about tonight because that's a different objective. That's a different DNA. Right? But we're going to talk about our mission as a local church to the Treasure Valley and to Boise. Okay? So... Uh, to do that, I'm going to begin by describing what I'll, I'll just call different expressions of mission or different schools of thought as far as how God anoints people to engage missionally and to kind of build a framework that we can build on to understand how Jesus is discipling us to engage missionally with our world. And I just noticed this. There's like twice as many people here over here. So if you guys win, 
That's like saying a lot, because I don't know why, but <laughs> was like this side of the room a little more appealing on like the seats or something? Sorry, I'm like a little, it's, it's seven, you know, it's nice to be back at seven o'clock too. I'm glad you're here, you know, it's like I missed the seven o'clock. Six o'clock was nice, but it's not seven. So seven is the number of completion that must, you know, yeah, so, you know, I'm glad you're here, all right? You picked well. So, uh, different expressions of mission. So the first I'll talk about is Joseph and Daniel. Joseph and Daniel are Old Testament leaders, and they were anointed to serve pagan kings faithfully, right? So Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar, Joseph served uh, Pharaoh, and they interpreted their dreams. They offered wisdom, intercession, right? Their goal and their anointing was actually to help pagan kings be more successful in their leadership, Okay, that's a little offensive to our minds sometimes, particularly in a more modern context, but that is what they were called to do, right? And some modern equivalents of this would be Billy Graham, not so much in his evangelistic ministry, but in his ministry to the U.S. presidency. Uh, There's a documentary on Netflix right now that I'd highly recommend listening to on his life that actually goes more into detail that Billy Graham, he wasn't like out in culture criticizing the, the presidents, though I'm sure he, you know, there was things that they weren't doing. Doing that was the best or whatever, but he was a friend of the presidents and actually would go and be a pastoral presence and offer counsel and wisdom and prayer. And I'm sure he preached the gospel too, but do you see what I'm talking about? He was friends with them. He, he was a supporter. He, he was trying to help them be more successful in their presidencies. Uh, Reinhard Bonnke is another evangelist more in, to the African context. He has a book called Living a Life of Fire, and there's multiple examples where he was actually exalted and brought brought into the the executive offices of kings and presidents across the nation of Africa, and God, again, would use him to to minister and to help them become more effective in their leadership, right? And even... um, I put their current local expression. There's people within our church community that I've had conversations with that I won't go into details, but that God is exalting in different spheres of our city. And they are actually meeting and offering wisdom to to leaders that are not Christians. And God is giving them favor to actually minister to them and help them in their leadership offering them kingdom wisdom and kingdom perspectives. Does this make sense? So God is doing this today, even in our, in our, in our own church, in our own city. So um, does that make sense to you? The Joseph Daniel kind of expression, right? Uh, kind of a counterbalance to this is we have the John the Baptist, Jeremiah expression. And these were both prophets who are anointed to oppose and rebuke corruption within leadership, Right, so John the Baptist, you know, he's like rebuking Herod because he's sleeping with his brother's ex-wife. You know what I'm talking about, right? A little different than Daniel, all right? And uh, they're confronting unrighteousness, and really the goal is they're trying to produce repentance in the hearts and minds of people, right? Are you following me here? Uh, Some modern examples of this, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany, uh, he opposed Nazi rule. He opposed the kind of passivity, the passivity of the church in responding to the Nazi agenda, and he was killed for it, right? But he's a modern day equivalent of a John the Baptist mold. Uh, William Wilberforce opposed the the slave trade in the the you know British Empire, and from the place of Parliament went to, you know in very much openly opposition because that is what he was anointed to do. Okay, and. Uh, so, so we have the Joseph Daniel expression, we have the John the Baptist Jeremiah expression, and then we have Jesus who actually embodies both of these expressions in his ministry, but to different people and to different ways, right? And so we have Jesus here, which, you know, you, you heard the song, Jesus Christ, Friend of Sinners, or however it goes. Maybe you, I haven't heard it as recently as I thought either, right? But we have Jesus, Friend of Sinners, right? And the reason we say he's Jesus, Friend of Sinners is because... He was friends of sinners, right? Like the Pharisees didn't like it. And Jesus demonstrated the goodness of God. He demonstrated the kindness of God and the goodness of the kingdom in that he healed the sick. He delivered the oppressed. He multiplied food to feed hungry people. He, he you know, was... Uh, 
accepted people in their brokenness. The immoral woman thrown at his feet, he accepts her. You know, he doesn't condone her unrighteousness, but he accepts her. A gentle reed, he won't break. He says in the Sermon on the Mount something that was radically unconventional. He says, God causes the rain to, the, to fall down on the righteous and the unrighteous which was, comf- was, was very offensive to a Pharisee because they're saying he, Jesus was saying God gives favor to selfish Gentile people, pagans, right? So he's, he's demonstrating the kindness of God that Paul says leads to repentance, right? So basically Jesus comes and he begins to show the goodness of God and the kindness of God. Jesus offers wisdom that brings practical solutions to the rampant problems in the culture of the, of the day, Right? They were living in a very, very tense political climate, social, racial injustice. Right? The, the, the Romans were subjugating and oppressing the Israeli people. They had laws such as a Roman soldier could come to you any point he wanted and say, you have to drop whatever you're doing and carry my armor one mile, which was supposed to be a visible kind of pronouncement and a reminder to all of Israel, you're a subjected people group and you are underneath us. Right? Do we have any similar topics today in our nation? Right? Do we have any hot button, you know, super, super heated, painful things that are going on in our country? Yes, Jesus comes, displays the wisdom of God, and starts doing things that are radically wise and open up, just brilliant. And he says things like, hey, if they ask you to go one mile with them, go two. And what's he doing when he says this? Like, what's he doing? Right, right before Jesus says this, the Jews had basically two options. I'm either going to say yes and just kind of forfeit my dignity, and I'm going to do the walk of shame that I'm a subjected, oppressed person. Right? Or they're going to rebel, and they're going to get in trouble, and it's going to be rebellion, you know, and Rome punished rebellion. Right? So what are you going to do there? Jesus says, no, no, no. If they ask you to go one mile, go with them too. In other words... They can make you, they can force you to subject to obey their laws that are unjust, but they cannot take your dignity. I won't just walk you one mile. I will walk with you two miles, right? So Jesus was bringing solutions. Jesus was challenging the social structures, right? And uh, so he, he demonstrates the kingdom, and then he was preaching a message of salvation and repentance, which was the door of entrance into the kingdom, right? But he was a friend of sinners, he was very kind. People liked him. They were attracted to him. Like they liked to hang out with him. To the point that the Pharisees were like, something must be wrong with you. All those unholy people like you a lot. I, I long for the day when that's, the, that's what people say about the American church. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The sinners just love the American church. They knew Jesus was holy too, by the way. But they wanted to be around him, right? So he's a friend of sinners and who Jesus, but then Jesus also walks in the footsteps of, of a Jeremiah or kind of the prototypical Old Testament prophet. But his opposition and, 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 and conviction and righteous judgment was actually oriented towards the Pharisees, right? The leaders within the house of God. The leaders within the people of God, within Israel, right? And he, he confronts them. He uh, convicts them and, and exposes their corruption. He rebukes their vain religiosity, and he's not happy with it, right? So we, we see both and in Jesus. Does this make sense? All right, so, so here's some different expressions of missional engagement. And now I'm going to try to contextualize this into our church, which is in a post-Christian America. And I'm going to speak to some of the things um, that, that it may be confrontational to you. It may pose questions. This is why we're having, you know, questions. We ask questions. So I hope it provokes questions in you, right? But I, I titled this section, The Desperate Need of Humility in a Post-Christian America, right? This is a truth, this first point here that... Uh, I really hope hits, hope, hope hits home, and, and it's something that we deeply need to accept as the American church if we're going to ever see us begin to influence culture the way that God wants us to. And this, this is the truth. We are not living in a Christian nation. Yeah. America, the United States of America, is a secular nation. Yeah. It is not Christian. Yeah. Right? And, and the confusing part is that our nation within our own consciousness still has the sentiment of Christianity woven into it, right? So there's a knowledge of Christianity, but there is no, Jesus is not Lord of this nation. It's a secular nation, 
right? And I believe this has created a lot of confusion over within the church over the nature of how the church is to influence the United States of America, right? And I believe that the church must deeply come to accept that we are in exile, this is hard to wrap our head around because Israel knew they were in exile because they were actually exiled from Israel into Babylon. So they knew they were exiles, right? But the truth is in the United States of America, we're just as exiled as Israel was, but we didn't leave our nation. We got exiled to these four walls. And our influence stops at these four walls, right? Nobody cares what's happening in the Christian clique, Nobody cares what those Jesus people are talking about anymore. We don't have influence. We are a church in exile. And it's really important that we accept this, that we mourn the loss of what once was in this nation. And we come to accept that we are a people who have been exiled. And the reason it's important that we accept it is because exiles speak with a different voice and from a different platform than those that are in power and places of authority and positions of influence. It's a, it's a different methodology. The good news is that to, it doesn't matter to God that what is inside of us, the kingdom that is inside of us, cannot be contained. The Jesus that lives inside of you and me cannot be contained. He does not need positions of public prominence to make a difference in the world. He just needs a humble and contrite heart. But the church needs to recognize that we are exiled and we are exiles. And we need to learn to operate in our world from our exiled position if we're going to see influence. I see a lot of confusion around politics. And I just want to make something really clear right now. Jesus is not an evangelical. Jesus is not a Republican. Jesus is not a Democrat. Jesus Christ is Lord of the church. And the church is a grassroots people movement of anointed ones who have been called by God and equipped by God's spirit to leaven culture with the kingdom of heaven. Right? Jesus says the kingdom of God is like leaven. What is leaven? It's like yeast. It's hidden. It's discreet. It's, it's, you can't even, you just put it in the lump and it disappears. You don't even know where it is anymore. Right? Leaven. It's, it's from underneath. Right? It's, it's not overt. It's not direct. But the kingdom's like leaven. And though it's hidden and it's discreet and it doesn't initially seem like anything, it's not manifest. It leavens the entire lump, and it causes everything it touches to rise and expand. The kingdom is like leaven, right? And Jesus, he's not Lord of American politics. We need to really understand that. But he does desire to leaven D.C. with the way of his kingdom, as well as all the other realms of our culture. right? And this is the truth I just just want to just bring to your attention, is that leavening takes place from a heart of servanthood. Say servanthood. Right? Leavening takes place from a heart of servanthood, not through making demands and expectations. Right? So I just, we cannot expect our government to rule in righteousness. We're not a Christian nation. We're not righteous. We cannot expect our culture to exude holiness and selfless love. We're not a Christian nation. We cannot pronounce judgment on the sins of culture and act like they should adhere to the purity of Jesus when they don't even know him. It doesn't make sense. Now Daniel, let's go back to Daniel. Daniel served. He served Nebuchadnezzar. And because he served Nebuchadnezzar as an exile, he was able to leaven a wicked, pagan, prideful man. And the leaven of Daniel's influence as an exiled teenager from Israel transformed the heart of this leader to the point that he had a revelation as he was humbled in a field that the God of Daniel is the God of the world. Because an exiled teenager from Israel understand his position and his platform and his voice. And he served and leavened this wicked king with the leaven of the kingdom. And it transformed, it transformed an exiled wicked king or a king while he was in exile. So are you following me here? Exiles serve, leaven, and influence from underneath. From underneath. 
That's what exiles do. They serve from underneath because they're exiles. Humility is key in this hour. Right? I believe until the church can humble herself and recognize that, that, that there's actually, that, you, know, the, you know the fact that everyone, basically everyone in almost any denomination in America prays for revival, knows that we need a revival in our land? Revival itself is an indictment against the church. Revival implies that something needs to wake up, that something needs to get out of slumber, that something dead needs to come back to life. The fact that the American church needs a revival is an indictment against the church. God is correcting the church. The church, we need to humble ourselves, recognize that we have fallen from platforms of influence because we did not steward them well. Humble ourselves and recognize we've been exiled to these four walls and we need to learn how to serve culture. We need to learn how to serve Nebuchadnezzar. We need to learn how to serve and leaven our world and not come with these exalted demands and pronouncements and rallying judgments on how the culture needs to change and all the things going to hell and everything's broken. No, God's just looking for exiled people that will humble themselves and begin to serve. Right, but where I believe God is confronting and convicting is in the house of God. So many Christians, I believe, need to go and refresh in Matthew about the log in their eye. Because it's so many Christians want to get out and get their trumpets and begin railing judgments on all the sins of the Babylon that we're living in. Of all the sins and the brokenness of American culture. When I was like, God's like, I don't care what's happening in Nebuchadnezzar. I care what's happening in my bride. Where I'm wanting holiness and righteousness and purity and integrity and in the kingdom of God is in the church. Look at the speck in your own eye. Come under the yoke of my discipleship. Come under the, 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 the leadership and let me create you and make you holy. Right? We're, the church is afraid. The reason people judge and fear is because they're afraid. American church is afraid. It's afraid to accept that, we, that, we are, that, we ha, that we're exiles. It's afraid and so it's so much easier to get out and think, get on our microphone. But it's not accomplishing anything. It's a liberated bride that will bring liberty to the world. It's a pure bride that will release purity to the world. It's a, right? What happens here will impact the world. God's concern, where Jesus is Lord, is of the church. And I believe that we can, we don't have to look out and be so afraid of what's happening out there. I think God is in the work of bringing renewal and revival to the church, which is correction and resuscitation and waking up a sleeping beauty. All right, I wanna make this practical to here and now, to the city of Boise, to River House Church. All right, because I believe Daniel's a prototype, I believe Daniel's a model in what mission looks like in a post-Christian America as an exiled church. The world needs redemption. As you know, I read the quote, we, we can't claim to have resurrection power inside of us and not go. And not go and be with the dying world. What does that say about us if we believe we have resurrection power and healing and life and liberty and we keep it to ourselves? Right? God is wanting to bring redemption and resurrection to a broken, dying planet. He's wanting everything that we have within us to be expressed out there so that his kingdom can come on earth as it is in heaven. And this means a lot of redemption. Right? And there's two, there's two levels of redemption. There's individual redemption, which we all intuitively know, and then there's institutional redemption. Right? So the, the individual redemption is at the personal level. Right? I just put a list here. Addictions, divorce, poverty, disease, depression, racism, hate, competition, insecurity, fear, eating disorders, perversion, idolatry, etc., 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 etc. There is so much brokenness in our world, and we have 
the healing balm of heaven. We have the hope of Jesus. We have resurrection life that is flowing within our veins because the resurrected Jesus has chosen to reside within us. Right? And, and, and so we know this. We're, we're to love our neighbor. We're to be the good Samaritan. We're to stop for the one. You know, we, we heard some a beautiful testimony tonight of a community within our church that's choosing to step out and, and build relationships with people that are different than them, that have different stories than them, right? Just, just, just to know them, right? And because it starts at the individual level, right? We, we all have somebody that God's calling us to love on a daily basis, but God's redemption does not just can start, stop at the individual level. He wants to see institutional redemption, right? And when I'm talking about institution redemption, I'm talking about the systems that are actually producing the culture that we're living in. So systemic poverty, systemic racism, systemic, systemic inequality, political injustice, et cetera, et cetera. Right? The, the, these are actually the systems that are producing the city culture of Boise, Idaho that you and I are experiencing. Right? And, the, and the truth is that the systems of any city, the institutions of any city are actually producing the climate, the culture that a lot of the individual brokennesses are actually coming from. Right? There's, so God, we, you know, we read in Matthew 6 today that his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We see very clear imagery and prophetic utterance around the idea that heaven is a city called Jerusalem. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. Heaven is a city. So when Jesus prays that his kingdom come on earth that is in heaven, he's saying you're going to heaven, which is a heavenly city where God is governing, but I also have commissioned and anointed you to bring the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, down into your city. God is after cities. He's not just after individuals. He's after them, but he's after cities. He's after the institutions, the systemic structures that are producing the culture of the city. In the city of God, there is no homelessness. There is no poverty. Everyone is significant. Everyone has an identity and a purpose. Nobody would ever want to be anybody else in the city of God because God is governing and everyone who is the image bearer of the creator has something to offer for the common good of the community. God is a genius. He knows how to create a city and he wants to anoint his church, these anointed ones, to go out into culture and to leaven it so that the kingdom of our Lord and God God becomes what's actually happening on earth as it is in heaven, right? So that God wants to transform the systemic structures that are producing the culture of Boise, Idaho and the Treasure Valley, right? You may have heard there's a teaching out there called on, on the mountains of culture. I like the word mountains. It's, been, it's essentially referring to the institutions that are creating our culture, Right, so there's seven that, you know, that there's probably more, but this is what people have identified. is a, a religion, business and finance, government and politics, education, family, arts and entertainment, and media. All right, and so God is anointing people that he desires to actually ascend these mountains to leaven them with the culture of the kingdom. All right, so, so how do we climb a mountain? Institutional redemption begins at the individual level. Right, we can't despise small beginnings, right? And this is, this is the truth. I just want to really hit you with this tonight, is that we are not supposed to wait around for an ecstasy or an epiphany from heaven to get us to start engaging with our world. Right? It's like sometimes I think it's like, it's like you know, I, I climbed Mount Bora, Bora years ago. Anybody climbed it before? You know, you like camp in at the base camp. You wake up in the morning. I hadn't really seen the mountain because I got there at night. I like, it's the sun starting to come up. I like take my first step and it's like, whoa, this steep. Literally, you're right at the parking lot. It's like this steep. Then I look up. I'm like, it, it's that steep the whole way up. And about 15 steps in, I'm like, am I sure I want to climb this thing? Like this going to be a long, steep walk. Right? And I think so often it's like we hear this vision of institutional redemption that God wants to transform a city. And it's like, yeah, let's do it. We take like 10 steps. It's like, whoa, that thing's steep. Yeah, it is steep. And it's like, you know, I'm just in a season of rest. That seems like too much work. <laughs> <laughs> How 
How do you climb a mountain? One step of ascent at a time. It's not easy because the world we're living is broken and dying and there is resistance. And our battle's not flesh and blood, though we may have conflict with people. Our battle's against spiritual forces, right? There's a war going on that we're only partially aware of. And we're we're, we're blind, we're ignorant if we think that there's not something evil that's going on. The Bible, it's just so clear. We have an enemy. He doesn't want the kingdom to advance. But when Jesus stood on the cross and said, it is finished, I have the faith to believe it. I got the faith to believe it. So we're, we, are, we are walking into a battle that we will win. The only way we lose is if we give up. So institutional redemption starts at the individual level. And we're not waiting around for God to just say, oh yeah, if, if, if it's meant to be, then it will just poof onto my lap. And all of a sudden I'll find myself like in this position to do such meaningful transformation in my world. No, it's one step at a time. It's one person at a time. It's like, it's like what we heard tonight. Let's, let's, go, let's go, go to the bridge and have, a commun- and have a revival group under the bridge and see what happens. Let's go on Wednesday evenings and invest two hours with a group of people that got moved to our city because of some sort of national atrocity and trauma. They didn't even want to leave their land, and now they're here in, in a neighborhood of our city. Let's spend two hours a week and see what happens if I just get to know them. Yeah, come on. Institutional redemption starts at the individual level. And you just have to step out because when you step out into the midst of the pain of the world, that's where Jesus starts showing up because he's already at work. We're not starting anything. We're just joining him where he's already working. Right? And the creative process is not always linear. I, I put in here this story. I, when I was doing my master's a few years ago, I'm still not quite done with it. So. <laughs> it's because this dang church grew too fast, okay? I, I did a, a case study. On a, it was a, a, a church in Pasadena where this woman had a heart. There's a lot of refugees around them. She had a heart. She realized that they needed extra tutoring because they're coming in out of country into an American school system. They don't know the language, right? So they're just helping them with their maths or whatever. And so that was the first step. Let's just help a few kids after school tutoring. And she uh, was part of driving a, a group of them home, like, you know, whenever it was, Tuesday, Thursdays at 5 p.m., and she noticed week after week after week that when she would go to drop them off at the door, their parents weren't home. She started to be troubled by this, began asking them, why why aren't your parents home? They began to say, oh, well, it's because both of our parents are working two jobs. And she was disturbed. Because she knew them, because she'd taught them some math tutoring, and then she knew them enough that she was disturbed that their parents were home, she realized, wait, they're having to work two jobs, and it started hitting her. They're under this yoke of poverty where now they're refugees in a new country. The kids aren't getting not just education needs met, but they don't even have parents at home because their parents have to work so hard just to pay rent to meet in, to meet the month's end. And they're never going to get under this yoke. They started getting disturbed. Out of this disturbance, it's a long journey, but it produced this business model where they, it was a land share agreement where they started getting refugee families their own land with their own houses so that they could get out of the yoke of this economic oppression so that parents could actually be home with their children. They could have land and these people that got stolen, everything that was theirs could start to produce their own legacy in a new land with a new story. And I'm like, man, if that doesn't preach the gospel, I don't know what does. Right? But you don't just arrive there. You don't just kind of sit on your butt and say, oh yeah, give me this, give me this epiphany from heaven of what I'm going to know. You have to actually get out into the midst and get to know people. Right? We can look all we want and say, oh my gosh, our world is so broken. There is so much systemic poverty. The world is so broken. And God's like, Get to know someone that's under that yoke and actually hear their story and look into their eyes and let me move you and let me speak to you. There's so much systemic racism. Well, get to know someone that's of a different color and hear their story and who knows what God's gonna do. How do you climb a mountain? One step at a time. But we have to step out and use some intentionality and step up that mountain and start walking. And I believe that when God sees people stewarding that daily walk, that long obedience in the same direction, he will begin to bestow and trust favor and he'll begin to move you up that mountain of culture, up into institutional places of authority where you can begin to leaven not just individuals, but systemic structures that are producing the culture of our city. 
with the leaven of his city. And his city will always, his culture will always empower the least of these and the broken and the poor and the needy. And I believe that if we can steward this as a people of God, if we can just be the church that Jesus paid his blood for, we will see transformation that is measurable and objective and is in plain sight to political and business and economic leaders in our city. Well, they'll start saying, oh my gosh, those people over there on Sundays that say that God's in their midst and lives inside of them, there's something to them. They're actually transforming the world in a measurable way where we are seeing oppression alleviated and the darkness and the pain of this world healed. That's good preaching. So the creative process is always linear, linear and institutional redemption begins at the individual level and we all have that choice today. Tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. God's looking for people that will say yes. In this, uh, as we're talking about leavening with the kingdom, I want to, again, make this practical. And I want to just kind of have a discourse between about salvation and the kingdom. Right? Evangelical Christianity has rightly prioritized the salvation of souls, but often implemented terrible means of engaging in this work. Bad salesmen, right? Anybody? Right? People with an agenda to get someone saved when it's not our job to save anyone. Our, go- our job's to love. Right? With an agenda to get someone to pray a prayer when God just wants you to lay down your life and love and serve someone. Right? So we want to see people saved and come home to the kingdom. Right? But the reality is that post Christian America has a strong mental. A, a, a stronghold like a that that's thick that they they don't want that message they they kind of know like oh you're you know you're a you're a soul winner you're one, you know you're gonna get me saved like I don't like that right and it doesn't mean that we don't preach it but what I'm trying to say is that the culture of the kingdom makes the gospel of salvation attractive right Jesus went to sinners showed them the kingdom then they wanted the kingdom and the way you get into the kingdom is repentance of sin and salvation. Right? And so the gospel, the culture of the kingdom makes the gospel of salvation very attractive. And that is true whether you're in religion, education, government, business, media, any of those mountains of culture. Jesus is highly attractive. And everybody wants a king like Jesus. So when you accurately represent the kingdom and the king of that kingdom, it's very, very attractive. Right? And this, this is just a few examples that, of, of what kingdom leaven practically looks like. And this is, that we are empowered to do any of these things every day. It is a choice to, to take the worship of Sundays to the rest of the week. All right? And this is what worship looks like. This is, this is what our worship looks like. And this is how we leaven a, a, a secular, post-Christian America. All right? Honor. Kingdom leaven looks like honor. Honor sees and speaks to the golden people. It champions leadership in our life. All right? Honor, when you, when, you, when you begin to truly treat people with honor, it's because you have a revelation of their identity as a royal son or daughter of God. Right? Nobody walking around thinks they're royalty. Right? There's something in us that loves royalty, which is why millions of people tune into BBC to watch the royal wedding. Right, because it's like there's this something about us that's drawn to royalty, but the truth is we are royalty, and when the church begins to recognize that, we begin to treat and speak to people like they are formed into the image of God. That, that will produce a cultural environment, a shift. If people say, I, I don't know what it is, but you bring something out of me that's so beautiful, it's because you see Jesus in them. You see the image of God that though marred by the sin and the brokenness of this, this world, it cannot be destroyed, and you can pull it out in them. What you speak to in people is what comes out of them. Honor leavens environments with the culture of the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Faithfulness. God is faithful. When we begin to exude faithfulness and be faithful like he is faithful because of the work of sanctification in our lives, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we become faithful, we will be consistent We will be trustworthy. People will know what they're going to get with us because we are consistent day after day after day. My yes is yes. My no is no. I exude integrity. 
that changes relationships, that changes corporate environments, that changes any, any environment that we're put in. Excellence. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He'll stand before kings. Right? Excellence, the heart of excellence is not perfectionism. The heart of excellence is that everything that I'm given to do, I will do as worship unto the Lord. You want me to do an expense report? I will do that with everything that's in me because I am a work of art and an artist at work and everything I do glorifies the God who created me. I, I'm the, my creative ability is derived from God as the creator and everything I do is worship. Mediocrity will not be found in my life. There will be no compromise. There will be no half-heartedness. Everything I do, I will do with all my might unto worship unto Jesus. That will transform that will transform any culture you're in. You, you want promotion in the workplace? Do everything you do is worship unto God. There was a monk named Brother Lawrence. He wrote a book called Practice of the Presence. For decades, his task in the monastery was to do the dishes. And there's literally accounts of people would come from all over the place to watch that man do dishes because he had a revelation that it did not matter what he did. Everything he did was worship unto God. And I swear, people would come and they would watch him do the dishes because God inhabits the praises of his people. And wherever worship is released, the presence and the atmosphere of heaven falls. And you can create an open heaven in your boardrooms, in your workplaces, because everything you do comes because I'm going to glorify God with everything that's within me. I'm going to bless his name. There is no such thing as a meaningless task to me. I'm a man or a woman of excellence. Humility. I clean up my messes. When I fail someone, when I wrong someone, when there's a breach of integrity, I humble myself. And as it is to me, I make it right. I repent when I'm in the wrong. I'm quick to humble myself and go low. When people wrong me, I extend forgiveness. I build trust. I build connection. I exude humility in everything that I do. You will win favor with people. Because humility, I believe, is one of the most attractive things any human can ever possess. And we claim that Jesus Christ is our Lord. The one who was in the form of God but emptied himself. So many Christians are waiting, God, give me my platform. God's saying, I've given it to you. You're steward it well. Wisdom. Solutions to problems, insight into situations, fruitful ideas. The spirit of wisdom rests within us. Jesus Christ, the fountain, the one in whom all wisdom is found, has given us his Holy Spirit. We have access to more learning than all the libraries of earth can contain because he is creator God and he's given us his mind. He's given us his spirit. He is our, our personal guide and tutor and counselor. There are no problems that, that a Christian does not have access to solutions for. We, we whine and complain about difficulties and problems. And God's saying, I have put you here for such a time as this. Because in your weakness, in your lack, I am strong. Lean into me and trust that I will use your mouth to offer wisdom. People in decision-making roles are bent over by the weight of all the decisions they have to make. When the people of God begin to offer the wisdom of heaven that resonates with them, there are still dreams being dreamt by leaders and culture that they're searching the answers for. And we have the answers because we have God within us, Christ in us. All right, those are just a few. That's just a few things. That's just a few ways that we can leaven any environment we're in with the culture of the kingdom of God. I try to live my life by this. When you don't have favor, you don't speak. Right? So there's, it's not like you just are literally silent. But there's, I, I will not offer my thoughts, perspectives, opinions when I don't have favor. Because I just don't. But when you do have favor, people will listen to you. Meaning this. As we effectively learn to leaven environments, people will begin to notice and, and observe there is something other about you. There, there is something different. There is life exuding from you. They will begin to ask you questions. And when someone asks you questions, which is the practical fulfillment of Isaiah 60, verse 3, arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is upon you. Kings will come to the brightness of your rising. 
who are kings. They're the ones influencing the systemic structures and institutions of our culture. Kings will come. They'll start asking you questions. And when people ask you questions, they're listening to what you have to say. You, you've actually, God has exalted you in their sight. And you're then poised at that moment to offer them Christ. I'll close with this. In this expression of mission, in this school of mission, there's a really important tension to navigate. And uh, that is between being all things to all men and then also recognizing that it is the conviction and the repentance of sins that is the door of entrance into the kingdom. Right? So though Daniel was tasked to serve Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Cyrus faithfully, right, he still could never, he, he would not compromise on his prayer life even though he thought he thought it was going to cost him his life right and so in this 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 leavening role where we're leavening people with the kingdom we have to have high discernment between am i operating in wisdom or am i operating in the fear of man meaning this daniel's in a role where he's serving the the foreign pagan kings he could have easily said oh no i should just not pray as well you see what i'm saying i should give that up because i'm just in a leavening role no he still had to be uncompromising to the purity and the holiness of God and his, and, and, and his leadership. And it's the same today. As we are in an exiled role and we are leavening, the day will come when God, no, you need to preach salvation. You need to, you need to have the hard conversation. You need to, whatever it may be, and there's going to have to be an ongoing discernment through relationship with Jesus Christ in all the contextual situations we're in between wisdom and the fear of man and I, I, I am to be all things for all men and to serve and to leaven, but I also will be bold. And when it is my time to speak the bold truth, I will speak the bold truth. Does that make sense? All right, well, let's just stand up and I'm going to pray. Lord, we thank you for your fiery missional heart that is just compelled by love to the world. And we just say, here we are, God. Just, just do whatever it takes, God. Disturb, convict, expose, encourage, inspire, whatever it takes, God. Just do a work in us so that we can see a missional expression through our lives, God. We thank you for what you're speaking. We thank you for how you are exercising authority into this house to, to guide us into effective missional engagement with our world. We thank you, God, for the culture of your kingdom. And we ask, God, that you will so leaven us with it that the natural byproduct of our life is that every person and every situation that we ever face in our lives, God, we will leave knowing that we served well and we leavened effectively with the beautiful, powerful resurrection life of the, of the kingdom of God. So we say, God, that your kingdom come and your will be done in Boise and in the Treasure Valley as it is in heaven. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Riverhouse podcast. For more information, visit riverhouseministries.com.